Welcome back to the program. In the night of 22 to 23 August 1791, men and women torn from Africa and sold into slavery, they revolted against the slave system to obtain freedom and independence for Haiti. This was gained in 1804. Now the uprising was a turning point in human history, greatly impacting the establishment of universal human rights, for which we are all indebted. We now discuss of human bondage, considerations and slavery in Trinidad. An August lecture presented by the Carnival Institute of Trinidad and Tobago. Now, Judy Raymond is a journalist. She's the author of The Call of Shadows. And Dr. Kim Johnson is a historian, filmmaker, and director of the Carnival Institute. We're very pleased to have them here. Good morning and welcome to the Good program. Hi, hi, DK. You're laughing. Now, I want, to start, I want to start off making the distinction between Trinidad and Tobago as it pertains to the lecture. Is When you say the considerations of slavery in Trinidad, does that include Tobago in this instance? No, it doesn't. The two islands are quite different. I mean, as we know, Trinidad and Tobago have very different histories. Tobago was established as a sugar colony and therefore a place where plantations were worked by enslaved Africans or people of African descent long, long before Trinidad was developed in the same way. So you're going to give the talk. What are, what are some of the considerations that we're going to, you're going to be speaking to? Basically, I think there is an idea that once people were taken away from Africa, brought on the Middle Passage, and put in the cane fields, it's impossible to know anything about what became of them after that, um, which is very, very far from the truth. There are all kinds of records about individual people. And also that it's impossible to know very much about what their lives were like. Again, there are a lot of contemporary records, both official and unofficial, from which you can get all kinds of information about how they were treated, what they wore, what they ate, how they dressed, how they lived. And, and my book is about all of those things. And we want to jump back into that just now. But Dr. Johnson, when people hear Carnival Institute, uh, sometimes they may get an idea that is not that doesn't really give uh, an, the full scope of works <laughs> done by the Institute. Uh, what does the Institute do? <laughs> well, gosh, you're asking an embarrassing question there. <laughs> um, well, first of all, I, I, to understand Carnival, you have to understand other aspects of culture. And you have to see its, its, its impact. So, for example, if you're doing something on, on Carnival, you could just as, just as well begin to include Pagua. Um, so in, in our documentaries, we began to discover the sort of ramifications and the, the, the reciprocal influences with other cultural um, arts in Trinidad. So even though the Carnival Institute was first set up to document and to educate people about Carnival, I mean, since I've been there two years ago, I began to broaden the scope to include other things and other territories as well. So one of the documentaries we did last year, um, looking at the Jab Jab Mass and um, the stick fighting and the Blue Devils, we saw parallels with Haiti and with Carrier Coup. So it's, it's kind of, this mandate is broadening and that's moving out of Carnival and moving out of just Trinidad and Tobago. So that, that's the first answer. But we had, we had a, a lecture on emancipation last year. We had Bridget Burton and um, Sprang Along. And, you know, the celebration of emancipation is, is arguably um, the origins of our carnival, or at least the origins of the African input into carnival. So we see a direct link there. Um, and I, I love the juxtaposition of Prof. Breton and Sprangalan. I can see that making for some very in, interesting conversation. And you also started to answer my question of the significance of having this August lecture and the topic of the August lecture as we move from, or we move from emancipation to independence to Republic Day. Well, I thought uh, that those were two huge steps the, the, the society took. One, emancipation, and second, independence. And in a sense, I see they're both sort of works in progress. And they, they kind of, they, they are the boundaries of August, you know, the 1st to the 31st. And I thought it would be a, a very kind of appropriate time to us, for us as a nation to have 
essentially a conversation on these issues, these two um, works in progress, uh, these, these unfinished jobs we began. And I would like to develop it into an annual lecture, which I see, in a sense, as a national conversation on these issues, which I think are you know, perhaps two of the most crucial issues we have to deal with. I mean, I wouldn't say it's appropriate, but it's, it's significant that people are now recognizing the importance of Macandal Dagger for our social development. I mean, what the, the, the 1970 movement the, was the beginning of, of attempt, it was an attempt to complete independence. You know, what happened in 1962 by, say, 1967, people had realized it was just on paper or what? We were not independent at all. We were still colonial. And that resulted in the, the outburst of 1970. So the, the perhaps growing awareness, um, at least among younger people, of the importance of Macandal Daga, again, points to the significance of these issues and significantly in the month of August. Mr. Raymond, how important is it to actually articulate so like Dr. Johnson just spoke about Macandal Daga and making sure that people know people are engaged, especially younger people who are coming up who may not have lived through that experience. How is it, how important is it to actually have these articulated human experiences? Because many people just think of slavery as a, a block of slaves, faceless, nameless individuals. There's no mm -hmm. history about them. So your book, as well as books like the Guineas are the sons. Um, how important is it to actually have that and put faces to these names and numbers? I think it's massively important for us to understand more about what slavery was actually like and how it affects our society now. I mean, you know, some people feel that, you know, it's a long time ago, we should just put it behind us and, and carry on, we're independent now and so on and so on. But you see, so many of the attitudes that people have towards issues today, towards each other as groups, as, as races, um, attitudes towards human rights, about the way people treat animals, things like you know, corporal punishment and all of those, all, you can trace all of those attitudes back to how people were treated in the days of slavery, which, as history goes, was not that long ago. It's only a few generations, and we certainly have not, as a society, recovered or more, put that behind us. And I think we need to be a lot more aware of what it was actually like, how it affects us today, um, before we can start to you know, come to terms with it and, and, and change how we are as a society, which clearly needs to be done. I mean, I don't think anybody would deny that in many ways this is still a very unjust society and that a lot more change is still needed. And we see, we still see effects in, in terms of like Haiti having to pay for their independence after winning it. Oh, definitely. And then there, there, there's a the whole reparations movement. I mean, I'm not sure where that's going to end up, but that, that is in fact growing in momentum as people recognize that, no, this is not ancient history. This is, this is something that is still affecting us now and there's today. And there's a recent article where you have African nations actually joining that groundswell in the call for reparations. Well, yeah, they, I mean, they, they had hundreds of thousands of their best people taken, taken away from them in, you know, in the prime of their life when they were going to be most useful and productive in their societies and brought over here for the benefit of the colonial powers. So yes, you could understand they're, they're wanting to be part of that movement as well. People always talk about these kind of dialogues as conversations in power, who has the upper hand. Um, I'm wondering, there have been a raft of discoveries well, people accounts of who owned the amount of slaves. Um, I think is yeah. Is a lot. A lot of research is being done in Britain, in particular. I mean, they are they are now uncovering again just how extensively Britain benefited. People in Britain benefited from the wealth that was generated by the slave trade, and to what extent that powered the industrial revolution. And was how many Williams' thesis, eh? Capitalism, okay. Capitalism and slavery, that, that slavery... Well, again, I mean, history is very easily forgot, uh, forgotten. And, and what they're doing now is compiling an actual list of individual slave owners. Yeah, David Cameron. 
Yeah, Benedict Cumberbatch's family owned slaves in Barbados and so on. So, so a list of individual slaveholders and exactly how much money they made from their holdings in this. So, giving, part of visi the world. giving visibility to those types of accounts, what does that do to the conversation, especially with the move for reparations? Well, one thing, I think we are now becoming a lot better informed about what slavery was like in this part of the world. I mean, everybody's seen 12 years a slave and so on. Everybody watched Roots when that was, you know, I think one of the, the, the first feature series about life under slavery. And there are a lot of assumptions about what it was like, you know, that it was more or less the same as it was in the American South. In fact, it wasn't. It was worse here. People died a lot younger. Sugar, I mean, in the American South, they mostly grew cotton. Sugar was working sugar, working in the cane fields was a lot harder. A lot more people died younger, were worked to death quicker. And I think, you know, the more detail we know about what, what, what that was actually like, the better, obviously. Speaking about details, August lecture, when is it? What time? How can people avail themselves of it? It's on the Saturday. August the 27th at the National Museum at 6 p.m. And uh, that's also a significant um, place and, and, and collaboration because <clears throat> the Carnival Institute is collaborating with the National Museum to build a Carnival Museum. So it, it's, you know, it's the beginning of a, a, a beautiful relationship, I hope. <laughs> but also, um, Judy's book, looks at Richard Bridgens, who was, in a sense, the, the documentalist of slavery. And I thought it very appropriate that it should take place at the National Art Gallery, because Bridgens was, he was an artist after, after a fashion. And that's an important part of um, Judy's narrative, I think. I don't want to, to suggest what she can talk <laughs> about. <laughs> Right, but we want to thank you so much and these are conversations that we need to have and I'm glad that the boundaries are being stretched because many times it's cool to put on certain types of wear and have certain types of conversations around certain period because it's almost as though it's a kind of festival as opposed to saying that this is something that we need to have on the front burner. We need to be consciously speaking about it in a manner that informs daily life as opposed to just seasonal life. So we want to thank you both, Mr. Raymond, Judy Raymond and Dr. Johnson. And we hope to hear more about this August lecture and Call of Shadows and stuff just going forward.